Well, welcome this really wonderful family of brilliant young people. You children are really smart. I remember last week you knew everything. And we hope our friends from Indonesia are with us again. So now we're going to, of course, you children are too young to make the Hajj. Have any of you known anyone who went on Hajj or did Umrah, any grandparents, or did you know of anybody, any of you? Yeah. You did, you've known people? Well, it's a good thing to know about, not only because you want to understand why they go and why it's such an important part of our religion, right? But I'll tell you something really special, everybody. The ideas you're learning in order to make the pilgrimage are also important for your life right now as it is. Do you know there are two journeys? One journey is the one we're on right now. You're grown, you all are going to school, you're growing up, you'll probably get married, you know, you'll have a life, you'll get grandchildren, then you'll die. That's that's a life, a one kind of a journey, right? But the Hajj is another kind of a journey, right? And it has ideas in it, which we can use right now. But today, I mean, um, you know, the this book you're looking at, you see the cover, The Mysteries of Pilgrimage for Young People. This book was really written for older kids, sort of 10 years old and older. And then we have in the back of it one for little kids. But it's all really, really profound stuff. And even though I think it's going to be a little over your head, can you listen to it anyway just to sort of know what's going on in general? Would that be all right? All right. So um, when your parents or people make the Hajj, this tells the inner meanings of it this book. Uh, if they're going to make a regular pilgrimage, like your granny, she needs to buy a proper Hajj manual, which um, which is adjusted for everything you need when you get there. So now, um, but the essential ideas, even though this book was written by Imam al-Ghazali, oh, uh, 900 years ago, yeah, 900 years ago, everything is still the same. The, the, and so, have you ever heard of um, uh, our, our friend Hamza Yusuf? He's a great scholar. No. Yes. He's great. And, um, I, yes, yeah. I live next to yeah. him. Yeah. We have. He, he yeah. wrote the introduction for this book, and he said, many things make journeys, right? Like, um, like, I mean, some journeys we do, we're just going on vacation, right? Or visiting our grandmother. But the Hajj journey is really important for all of you because it's the other part that's real in your life. But think of animals, don't animals? Think of the monarch butterfly and think of salmons. They set off on, on journeys, the monarch flies from Mexico up to, Cairo, up to Canada and its children know how to get all the way back to Mexico. And the salmon come out of the ocean and they swim all the way back up rivers to get to the place where they came from and nothing can deter them. They, they don't lose their concentration, right? And, but they prepare for this. You know, they eat better, they get fat in their system because they're making a, lo a long journey, right? And so we can learn a lot from animals, right? We, we should be concentrated and we should prepare, right? So what we're going to do as people though, we, we don't have like animal instincts, how to get back to an ocean, but we have the instinct, we have the deeper knowledge to go out and try to become close to Allah and have knowledge of him. And so this Hajj journey is going to remind us of things we have forgotten. Do you know when somebody dies, they say, inna lillahi wa inna alayhi raja'un. Did you ever hear that? It says, surely um, we belong to God. And surely the return is to God. And so that very important idea you learn in the Hajj, by the way. So like, um, I keep doing this wrong here. So um, you have to know, children, that again, um, we all have a, a really unique golden heart, right? Does everybody remember that? You remember that you, you all have a golden heart, right? And so you have to remember that uh, your golden heart is the thing that you're supposed to take care of. And you're, going, and you're learning how to do that from the Mam al-Ghazali. Right now, in the story, the children 
are walking home from school, but today they're going to the magic garden. Do you see the door to the garden hidden behind the wisteria? Isn't it magical and beautiful? They're going to see Hajj Abdullah, right? And on their way there, they're talking about how much they've learned in their life from learning from him, how they know, just like you, the inner things to do with your wudu, the inner things to do with your prayer. These are all things you've learned. You learned about zakat and fasting last week. These are all very special learnings. And so, so anyway, um, the children are on their way to see uh, Hajj Abdullah. And they, they, um, and so let me just say, and so in order to, um, to, to, to learn anything, we need guidance. And we get this from the Quran. And we also get it from the, the, the prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. All right. So then let me just go to the next picture. All right. Now the children go to Hajj Abdullah and they speak to him. And he says to them, you know, the, um, the Hajj is an incredible chance for you to learn everything you need to know and how to practice. And uh, the Hajj teaches you, to it gives you a way to practice how dying while you're alive in this world. Have you ever known something that didn't die? Do, don't flowers die? Do people die? When the sun goes, night comes on, yes. Yes. Um, um, do animals go to heaven? They go, they go to the next world. Yes, everything, you know. And so since everything is going to die, isn't it good that we find out a little bit more about dying? Don't you think you need to know? Yes. Who else has their hand up there? Yes. Yes. Uh. We launched a show called Wild Crutch, and it's about animals. Oh, it's about animals. Oh, how lovely. Animals are so beautiful, right? Mm -hmm. And so, since everything- I have a question. Yes. Uh, my, my is so <laughs> um, uh, well, I heard once, like, it's that moose or something, don't all animals straight away go to heaven? Well, why wouldn't they, you know? Allah knows, Allah knows, you know, but I think so. So anyway, um, so they're sitting with Hajj Abdullah and they go to see him. And you know what they tell him? They're in the magic garden and little the fox is listening to him and a spider comes down and they say, oh, Hajj Abdullah, very exciting news. Two of us, uh, Bilal and Layla, we're getting to go on the Hajj with our grandmother and our mother and father. And Hajj Abdullah said, well, that's really interesting that you're gonna be doing this because um, this gives me a chance to teach you about the Hajj. And I just want you to know something, children. This may be one of the last few times you see me. I haven't been very well. So the children started crying and they said, what? You're dying? What's happening? We don't wanna lose you. And he said, what did we learn the very first time from the book of knowledge? One, we have uh, two, there are two kinds of learning. One is the special learning how to polish the heart. And we're learning to polish our heart because there are two worlds getting ready for the next world. In this life we're in has lots of difficulties. Remember that kids? And these difficulties are chances to polish your heart. But, you know, in the end, when you go to the next world, you're finally at peace finally and content and you have everything. So the children were really sad to think that Hajj Abdullah might die. But on the other hand, he'd given his life to polishing his heart. Why shouldn't he be allowed to go to the next world, go to paradise? So anyway, the children, the children said, oh, they would love to know all about the Hajj. And um, they said, you know, oh, let me see this, yeah. They would love to learn about the pilgrimage. They did know it involved wearing special clothes, visiting the Kaaba, spending an entire day on the plain of Arafat and asking for God's forgiveness in the company of Muslims from every community the world over, right? So Hajj Abdullah said that on his second Hajj that he, so we have to ask everybody, children, 
Why, what is behind all these rights going to all these places? What do they mean? And, and why are they so important? Would you like to find that out today? With lots of fun pictures, we're gonna, we're gonna learn that today. So Hajj Abdullah, when he made his, yes, his second Hajj, he used Al Ghazali's book. And so he's gonna tell us why it's so important to go to Mecca and Medina. Have you ever wondered why is it so important? And then like, um, why is Hajj considered the special worship, right? One of a lifetime, it is a seal or it's a crown for your other things, for prayer and purification, for zakat and for, for uh, fasting. This is, a, this is the crown of all these other ways. So anyway, keep doing that. So here are the two little children imagining themselves going to the Kaaba. This is Bilal and Layla imagining themselves sitting there. Can you all imagine what it would be like sitting there? Well, you should know there's, there's um, some hadith. The prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, said, if you perform the hajj and you don't say any low, stupid talk, right, and your actions are good, and, and when you return, you re return as pure as on the day when you were born. And he also said that a hajj that is accepted by Allah, right, is better than anything in the, than the world all the world, what it contains and everything in the world and it's rewarded by heaven. And by the way, Ghazali mentions, when you go on the Hajj children, you will be God's guests and you can, you can ask him for whatever you like. Now, if you have guests that come to your house, would you tell them no if they asked for something? No, so you would be God being God's guest. So by the way, some people ride on donkeys from, uh, to reach the pil to reach Mecca, and the angels run out and greet them. But some people walk there, and the angels run out and hug them and embrace them. Why do you think they would embrace the ones who are walking? Yes, they're they're trying to um, get more of Allah's blessing. Yes, because they're making more of an effort, aren't they? They're not just sitting riding, they're actually, they're actually walking. And so also when the pilgrims get to, uh, to the Mecca, you know, even if you're just sitting there, see the children are gazing, that Allah gives special portions of his mercy, 20% to those who are just sitting looking at the Kaaba and another 40 for those who are praying and another 60 of those who are walking around the Kaaba making tawaf, right? Now you see, see here's the black stone. Do you see the black stone? It's put in a silver casing and it's put in the corner of the Kaaba. And I don't know whether you know, knew or not, but it fell from heaven and the prophet peace and blessings be upon him and others helped to place it in the corner of the, of the Kaaba, all right? Now, there was a companion, radiallahu an, who named Omar. And you know what he said? He said, to the stone. He said, I know you were just a stone with no harm or benefit. And I only kiss you because the prophet kissed you. And then the companion Ali, radiallahu anhu, came and said, oh, I'm going to tell you a story. All right, children, get ready for an amazing story. All right. All right. In the very, very beginning, did you know Allah created Adam? He was the first prophet. And from Adam, all of us were inside of Adam before we even came to be. All humanity that were, would ever come to be were inside of Adam. And Allah said to Adam, Adam, am I not your Lord, your Lord? And Adam said, yes, of course you are. And God said, I, I ask you this because on the day of reckoning, the day of last judgment, I don't want you to say you never heard of this. You know, you never heard that. I was your Lord. So Adam and uh, Allah, there was a contract written, an agreement. Do you know where this contract is between Allah and Adam? It's inside of the black stone. It's inside of it. Can you imagine that? So this is an amazing thing. Um, um, 
So when you when you when you go to walk around the Kaaba, you start at the corner with the black stone. And the very first thing you say, you say in the direction of the black stone, if you can't get near, if you can get near, you would kiss it. But if you're way back, you just hold up your hand like this. And you again say, oh, God, I do this walking around the Kaaba, right? Believing in you, affirming the truth of your book and fulfilling your love. So you, you are remembering the contract that is made in your name. It's inside of there, all right? Wouldn't you all agree to this contract if Allah said, am I not your Lord? Would you all say yes? Of course you would, right? So then, um, just to let you know that if you're in Mecca when you get to go, if you fast for one day or do charity or some goodness, do you know it's worth 100,000 fasts anywhere else in the world? So you could go to Mecca and you could fast one day and it's like 100,000 fastings or acts of charity. And the value of prayer and good deeds are multiplied as well, you know? So see this little girl with her pure heart? Do you all have golden hearts like this? You do. Can you feel it? When you're praying next time, yes. re remember exactly, yes, you can feel it. This is who you really are. This is the real you inside, right? And so, you know, this little girl said, I would love to live in Mecca. But you know what they told her? No, it would be nice, but you might start taking Mecca for granted. It's much better that you're yearning to go back, that you're dying to go back. You know, the it's the house of Allah, right? And whoever visits it, visits God. So you should be yearning to visit God, not just thinking, oh, I live in Mecca, I live here. You might get bored, right? You wouldn't want to do that. So you yearn to be near to Allah, right? So then here's a story. See the little boy standing? You see the big curtain hanging down, everyone? That's called the kiswa. It's a beautiful covering. And they change it every year during, during the Hajj. They put up the fresh one. And this beautiful kiswa covers the Kaaba. Listen to the story. One night I was passing. Let me put my glasses on. One night I was praying in the Hijra. This is this little semicircular area where Sayyidina Ishmael is buried. When I heard a voice between the Kaaba and the curtain, the, uh, and the curtain, and the, the Kaaba said, to God I complain, then to you, O Gabriel, of what comes from those who make circuits around me engrossed in chatter and vain prattle. If they don't cease, I will quake with such a quaking like an earthquake, that every stone in me will go back to the mountains from which it came. So the children heard this story and they thought, they said, oh, we have to be careful when we're walking around the Kaaba. We can't just do any dumb talk, but you know, making, making tawaf around the Kaaba, walking around it is prayer. But you, know, you don't talk to people when you're making prayer, do you? But when you're walking around the Kaaba, you can ask your mother and father questions when you go. You can talk to each other, but you wouldn't do stupid talk, would you? You would never do that, would you? So anyway, the prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, right? He, he when he used to face the Kaaba, he would say, you are the best place on God's earth. Now, also, by the way, this is the city of Jerusalem. This is the, do you see, this is the Haram al-Sharif near the mosque of Al-Aqsa. This is the Dome of the Rock. If you go to Medina or to Jerusalem, if you do prayers and special acts of charity and good deeds, those also get, they're worth many, many, many more of them. So I hope you get to vis visit these three people, these three places when you get older. So now, um, here's the Kaaba. Here's everybody walking around it, right? So. One of the things, yes. Okay, I'll continue. Yeah. The, the okay. first picture before this one with the Kaaba. Yes. I've been there. You've been there. You've been to Jerusalem. Yes. So yes. 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 Mashallah, how lovely! I've been there too. Isn't it wonderful? I'm so glad you got to go there. It's so beautiful. So beautiful. I've been there. You've been there, and here is the Kaaba. 
Now, by the way, making this Hajj pilgrimage, it's a duty for every, every Muslim if you can afford to go and if you have good enough health. You want to go because it's so, so important. And you all are going to discover why it's so important. But if you can't go, maybe you're too ill. Maybe you could have someone do it for you. Maybe a daughter or a son who have finished their pilgrimage already, they can go, it, go, go and do it for you because it's a debt. It's something you owe to Allah, right? It's a debt like any other. Any other. And let's just read what it says here. The one who dies without having paid zakat or performing the pilgrimage will be among those who ask to be returned to the world. Imagine you're dead and you say, Allah, let me go back. I have to go back because it's from the Quran. And when uh, until death comes to one of them, he says, my Lord, send me back that I might do righteousness in that which I left behind. Wouldn't you hate to be dead and wish you could come back to life to do your pilgrimage or pay your zakat? You wouldn't want to do that, would you? So you're all going to be very careful and try to make the hajj when you can. All right. Now, the family, there's a family that you're going to make the hajj with today. We're about to go on hajj together, right? And here's the family. There's the grandmother, the mother and father, and two of the children. And they're sitting at home and they're they're planning, they're, they're planning their, uh, their, their Hajj. That evening, Layla, Bilal, Zainab, and Abdullah were thrilled to share with their family some of what they've been learning about their upcoming Hajj. Bilal said, I am so glad we have been watch watching and correcting our characters. It seems to me that the very things we shouldn't be doing on the pilgrimage, we shouldn't be doing in our life at home anyway. So you all are going to learn this, right? Now, one of the things you want to do is you want to have a good intention. Do you think if you're going on the Hajj, you should be doing it to do good business and make money or to go because you love Allah? What should you be doing it for? What's the intention? Yes. Yes. To go because you love Allah. That's right. That's right. And so also, you want to take extra money with you so you can be generous. Wouldn't it be horrible to be on the Hajj and you saw people in need and you were stingy and didn't have extra to give? So you want to take extra to give, you know, even you children, when you're walking around town or in your lives, you could keep extra change in your pockets in case you saw children like the, the Zakat story that needed something. So also, just like being having good intention in your life, also another thing you need to have on the Hajj is pure speech without a lot of, lot of arguing. Do you all, how are you all doing with arguing? Are you doing better with arguing? Because we've been talking about it. You are. All right. Because wouldn't it be horrible to go on the pilgrimage and argue? Well, it's horrible to argue at home. Do you like to hear people arguing? No. No. So, of course. Now, another thing. On I, the even, yes? I, even, I even tried to stop making them argue, but they still argued. And then I tried as hard and then that worked oh bless your heart that you tried bless your heart what a great blessing you had for trying that right and another thing you're not supposed to do on the hodge is hurt other people and if somebody hurts you or bumps you or says you just pay, you just bear it patiently like shouldn't you do that at school if somebody some, says something mean shouldn't you just be patient and bear it yes but what if they do it by accident Oh, well, then it's just an accident. Nobody cares, right? Now, uh, Imam al-Ghazali says, a sign that your pilgrimage has been accepted is when you come back, when you come back home, you stop doing and saying bad things, right? And instead of being with your friends that are really naughty and say, let's do this bad thing, let's turn over this, let's break this, let's do this horrible thing, you have better friends. And instead of spending all your time when you come back, just going to the movies and being entertained, you try to do something higher with your time. Join groups, maybe people who are praying or doing vic. So you have to remember something, children. When you make your hajj, it's a kind of dying. But what are you dying? If you come back and you don't do the same horrible things you were doing before, you're not the same person, are you? You're a better person. That old person is dead and gone. So you want to die off some of the 
the things you don't really think you should be doing. So now let's continue. Now here is Hajj Abdullah, right? Excuse me. Yes. Um, why does it cost so much? Why does it cost so much to go? Yes. Well, you know, plane, planes cost a lot, and then you get there and you have to have tents waiting for you. Like any, all travel costs a lot, you know. It's too bad it costs a lot. It used to be in the ancient days, people would walk from Africa, come by camel. They would do the long walking hajj, right? But, I mean, unfortunately. Now, um, Hajj Abdullah was sitting in his garden surrounded by animals. And he's like very, very peaceful, right? You see how peaceful he is, right? And he said, you know, you have to do, he said, listen to this. He said, know that there are, there is no way to approach Allah except by dying off one's lower desires and qualities, right? And instead living, and instead of living with excess, having too much stuff, choose to live with what you, what are really, what is ne our necessities? When you go on the Hajj, can you take a lot of luggage with you? No, you take a knapsack, you take a few changes of clothes and you're gone for weeks and you are, are, you can live with all that, right? You just change clothes, you wash clothes. So shouldn't we in this life l live with fewer things? Do we, is it good to have so much excess? Maybe our ex excess toys and clothes we should give to orphans, right? So it's very important, right, um, that we're very taking good care of our hearts. You see the little girl here, she's drawing her heart. The young people thought about their own hearts. Were they being polished enough? I hope you all are drawing your hearts and putting dots of the things you want to polish away. Uh, the children wondered why grown-ups didn't draw and assess their own hearts. They found it very helpful to write down a visible list found inside of their own hearts, things which they needed clearing away. It helped them to remember their true nature, the fitra, their luminous golden self. How did older people manage to fix themselves up if they didn't make a checklist for their jihad al nafs or struggle with their lower selves? And what about understanding you all want to have understanding. You don't want to just be told to do things. You want to understand it, don't you? Yeah, people need understanding. Now, it just might interest you to know that other faith traditions have different forms of retreats. There can be monks and nuns, and they go into monasteries. They go for short periods. They do long retreats. They may live there. But guess what? In Islam, the Hajj, Al-Ghazali says, is our form of retreat in our religion. It's very concentrated, right? It's aimed at dying off all your attachments to the lower things of this world, right? And, and learning to experience that you can live with less. So, the, so our kind of retreat is making the Hajj, right? And the Hajj also teaches you to surrender, to just submit and do what you're supposed to. And that's what the word Islam means, peace, submission, surrender, right? Because part of your pilgrimage are things like things that maybe you can't understand. You can understand if you're fasting, uh, that how that helps, helps your religion. You can understand zakat, giving charity. But if you're asked to throw stones at a pillar or run between two small hillocks, what you're doing, you're learning just to submit to what Allah asks. Like if a king told you, do this. If you were the servant of a king, would you say, why do I have to do it? Or would you just, would you just do it? What would you do? If a king told you, I want you to do this, would you do what he asked? Or would you say, oh, king, I'm not going to do it unless you explain it to me. So you I, see, yeah, yeah, do it's a way. Right away. Yeah, it's a way of practicing, practicing being obedient, right? So now here's the little girl. She's making duat. Now, before you go on the Hajj, everyone, you have to take responsibility. You, if you're going, what happens if you die and you don't come back? You could be in an accident. You could, something could happen to you. So you have to leave everything in order. Um, you have to make sure the people, the family you're leaving behind, 
who depend on you, that they're well taken care of. And your intention should be that you're doing it for God, right? And by the way, if you discover you're doing it for a low intention, like look what this girl says, be sure it's not to show off or be well thought of. Maybe somebody's making the Hajj because they want people to think, oh, they're really great. They're making the Hajj. The little girl says, it would be terrible to set out to visit the king, Yani Allah, for some other reason, like desiring to be seen or to be famous. So look at your hearts carefully. And children, this applies to you right now. If you notice you have a bad intention for something, maybe you're not really wanting to help mommy. Really, it's just for people to think you're really good. What you can do if you discover your intention is not that great, you can replace it. You can think, I'm going to put her, replace it with a better intention. Isn't that wonderful that you can do that? That you can replace your intention? So also you have to put yeah, everything. Yes, it is, isn't it? So one of the things you want now, this is this applies to all of you in your lives. Okay, get ready for this. Um, you have to put things in order. If you were in a bad mood with your mummy before you traveled, wouldn't you apologize and, and fix that up? If you had done things that you were sorry for, wouldn't you apologize? If you owed somebody money, if you'd borrowed someone's bicycle, wouldn't you return them and put everything in good order? Wouldn't yeah. you do that? You would, right. So Ghazali said, listen to this image. You won't believe this image. You can take and hang around your neck a bag, a sack, and put all the things in it that you haven't done that weigh you down. Like, for example, if you, if you have been mean to someone and you didn't apologize, it's hanging around your neck, weighing you down. You know how you feel bad about something until you put it right? You know, if you've been mean to your brother or something, you know, you don't, it's heavy around your neck. And uh, Imam al-Ghazali said, everything like that, that that's hanging around your neck, it, it's crying out to you, the bag of heavy things you want to fix. And it's saying, are you headed to the house of Allah, to the king of kings, having neglected some of the things he's asked you at home? Aren't you ashamed? Don't you want to fix your wrongs and ask for his forgiveness? Now, you have to do this if you're making the Hajj, but shouldn't you all do this every day in your life? You should, right. And uh, also, Ghazali tells us, you should turn your heart wholly and completely in the direction of Allah, right? When you're traveling. Otherwise, maybe if you're not thinking about Allah the whole time, you might as well not spare yourself the hardship and the exhaustion if you're just going to go and make Hajj and be thinking about everything else. So children, I want you to imagine you're going on Hajj. We're about to do it together, all right? And if you had to leave, I want you all to write a little will, what you would leave behind, what would happen to your toys and your things. Because you might be leaving all of your friends and never see them again. So be sure you leave everything in beautiful uh, uh, working order, right? Because um, the Hajj is going to help you practice for your final journey when you do die. So the Hajj is a chance to ask for forgiveness, to put things in order, to get used to living with less. And also, um, the best thing you can take with you on the Hajj is a golden heart. So children, don't you realize all these things that people have to do for the Hajj journey are the same kinds of things you have to do for your journey right now in your everyday lives, in your families and at school. So then the children are leaving. They're going to be leaving the next day for the Hajj. And just as they're leaving Hajj Abdullah, look what flew into the garden. What is it, everyone? It's a white peacock. Do you see it? In some traditions, the peacock is the symbol of paradise, of Jannah. So sometimes in nature, there are signs, ayat. Maybe this was a special sign because they would not be seeing Hajj Abdullah again, right? So the next day, they're getting ready to go on the Hajj. Children, are you all ready to go on the Hajj now? We're all going together. We're going to have this journey. So you can pay attention and you'll have a good idea because you're going to see pictures of it and learn some very interesting things about it, all right? 
So the first thing is, you see everybody's dressed in ihram. Do you know what ihram is? It's for men, it's wearing a, a piece of cloth around the waist and a piece of cloth over the shoulders. The woman I can wear a, a dress, it's all right, right? And so this cloth that the men wear, ihram, right? It's a, puts you in a special state. And you know what it looks like, ihram? The same cloth they wrap you in when you die in your, to put you in the grave. So even the clothes the men are wearing on the pilgrimage remind them that they're trying to die off all the lower things in their life. They're going to have a, a week or so where they're only thinking about Allah and asking forgiveness and trying to get their hearts back in order. So children, if you were going to go and meet Allah, would you wear blue jeans? Would you wear a, a, a party dress? Or would you prefer to dress in something that shows you are empty of everything but him? Would you wear ihram or would you wear blue jeans? Which, which would you do? Ihram, not blue jeans. Right, of course, of course. Uh -huh. Yeah, so anyway, the children, the, the family is making certain prayers and duas, and then they get in the car to leave. And you know what Layla says to her parents? Oh my God, she said, I am so glad I apologized to my friend Rukaya because I was mean to her. And, and now if I hadn't done that, I'd be carrying that like a sack around my neck, a heavy sack saying, where are you headed with never having apologized? So children, we also, we always want to ask ourselves every day, did we apologize for what we've done? You know, we have to be very careful. All right. Okay, the family is packed lightly. Do you see that? And the, and the main thing is their hearts have a good, clean feeling. And so they're setting out and they're going to the plane. And here is Bilal. He's sitting on the plane seat. Okay, pretend you've gotten to the plane, everybody. You're sitting on the plane, right? <laughs> and then, okay, you're on the plane. And then um, the plane flies over. A, a place where, which is called the Mikat. It's a place where you actually enter the state of Ihram, where there are things you can no longer do. And at that moment, you know, you see he's making an intention. Everyone sat straight up in their seats and repeated, I make the intention of entering Ihram, a special clothing, special state, for the sake of accomplishing the pilgrimage. Balak could feel the intention deep in his heart. And then, Everyone gets to say the Talbiya. Have you ever heard people saying the Talbiya? Here it is. La beka la huma la beik. La beka la sharika la ka la beik. Inna alhamda wa niyamata. La ka wal mulk la sharika la. Do you see it right here? Here I am at your service, O God. Here I am. Here I am. You have no part. You have no partners. To you alone is all praise and all blessing. And to you is these all is the sovereignty, the dominion. You have no partner. And you say this, you say this all the time when you're whenever you're moving forward, whenever you're with other people. But do you know what you're what you're doing here? This is quite amazing. What you're saying here, you're you're answering the call of Abraham, Sayyidina Ibrahim. Do you know that Abraham and his son Ishmael built the Kaaba? Do you remember that? They built it, Abraham lived around 4,000 years ago. And when he, they finished building this beautiful sanctuary where people were, God said, proclaim that people come here to this sanctuary to worship me. And Abraham mm -hmm. basically was thinking, I'm out here in the middle of the desert. If I call, you know, who will hear? Well, Allah was saying, you call and I will bring. So when you're making, when you're saying this statement, the Talbiya, Who's, you're answering Abraham, he called 4,000 years ago, and you're answering him now. Isn't that amazing to answer over 4,000 years? And not only that, you are also answering, you know, one day there's going to be a trumpet blast. Boom! And that calls everybody back, people who died, all the way back to be alive for the resurrection together. So this Talbiya you're saying, you're, you're responding to the trumpet blast and also to Abraham. So you see here, um, the grandmother is telling him, look, Bilal, 
you know, this ihram you're wearing, you see this cloth you're wearing like a, a burial shroud. Mm -hmm. You're going to be wearing this in Tawaf and making the sigh and going to Minna. And also when we go to Arafat, you see here the Mount of Arafat at sunrise. Do you all see Arafat here? Mm -hmm. All right. So anyway, the next thing, well, let's get going. We've reached Saudi Arabia by plane. And here are pilgrims from all over the world. You see all the luggage they have, these boxes of things they have. You know, they've got tons of luggage. Some would even bring food. And you see the buses in the background? Do you see the buses, children? Right? And there's some cars. Well, Ghazali points out you don't want to show off with your transport, right? You can take a bus or a van. You don't have to have a fancy, fancy car. And then he says something. Here they are in the bus. Do you see they're in their bus with the luggage on the top? You're leaving Jeddah and you're headed to Mecca. Now, children, we're on the journey. We're going toward the house of Allah, the Beit Allah. Now, on the way there, the grandmother tells them something very, very important. She said, this vehicle, a vehicle is something that transports you. Here in this case, it's a bus, right? She said, but really, this bus is to remind you of another vehicle. When you die, they put you on a flat board. It's called a beer, B-I-E-R. And that beer is taking you to the Kaaba. So it's like you hope to be visiting Allah dead to your old life, dead to your own thinking. You, 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 you want to make it like you're on your beer. You're dead and you've left everything behind and you're going to Allah with an empty golden heart, right? So now, are you ready to go? Are you ready to reach Mecca now? All right, here we go. Oh my goodness, everyone gasped when they saw the tall minarets of the Masjid al-Haram come into view. Okay, children, we're just reaching front door of the Kaaba, right? So we're going to go in now and be his guests. We're going to be the guests of Allah with our hearts open. Is everybody everybody's heart open right now? All right. All our hearts are open, right? Imagine kids. Now, um, you want to have a good state of being and soon you're going to even be able to touch the Kaaba, touch it itself. This, this building built by Abraham 4,000 years ago with his son Ishmael. And so in you go, here we are, right? Now, grandmother was worried. She said to the children, you know, you have to be a little bit worried here, right? That, that maybe you're not worthy to be so near to Allah. But on the other hand, you can have hope because Allah is so generous, you know? So, so you say the Shahada and come on in. So the children come in, oh my goodness. They first set their eyes for the first time on the Kaaba. And Layla and Bilal were dazzled by its grandeur and beauty. It stood majestically before them, like the silent center of the universe around which all else seemed to turn. It was as though their golden hearts recognized it, had always known it. They were home at last. Layla's eyes filled with tears. She was overcome by the splendor she beheld and the peace in her heart, right? So remember that tawaf, um, tawaf is, is prayer. So as you make it, let your heart be filled with fear and hope and reverence and love. You know? Now, this is something, children, this is very exciting what you're about to hear. You see, in making and going around the Kaaba, right, making tawaf, you are circumambulating, you are going with the angels. Did you know that, right? And by the way, this walking around the Kaaba that you're gonna be doing, don't suppose that the aim of making the circumambulation is for your physical body just to be walking around it. The aim, the purpose of tawaf is, is, for your, is, is of your heart, the tawaf of your heart by remembering God in his house. The Kaaba, do you see the Kaaba right here? You're seeing it with your eyes, everybody, right? Are you seeing it with your visual eyes, with your physical body? But it's a symbol in this world for a presence that your eyes can't even, your eyes can't even see, right? The Kaaba 
exists, it, the real Kaaba exists in the Alam al Malakut, a realm of dominion. Listen to this. The Kaaba is mentioned in the Quran as the Beit al Mamur, or the much frequented house, and has been thought to correspond to the Kaaba above the one you can see with your eyes. And the angels are going around it, just as we are about to do. And since we are far from being angels, children, we are asked to imitate them. We've been promised that he who imitates a folk becomes one of them. So we're going to pretend we're angels, everybody, all right? We're gonna imitate the angels who are above the Kaaba in a world you can't see. The angels are going around the throne, right? The throne of God. Okay, are you all ready, children? You are all being angels right now, all right? So now the next thing, oh, I'm gonna go a little bit further. You're gonna begin at the black stone, all right? We're gonna, the seven times we're walking, you start at the black stone. And remember what we're gonna do. We're gonna put up our hand, reach out and say, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar. In the name of God, God is the most great. We are remembering what? We're remembering what is inside of the black stone. We're remembering that we made a contract with God that he is our Lord. Remember that? All right. So then we, we renew our, our pact, our contract with God. And this is very, very serious. All right. Now, see this little girl? You know, the Kaaba has a curtain on it. It's called the Kiswa. It's a beautiful covering. You know what you can do, kids? You can go up and cling to it. And you can cling and hang on to it. You know, if you want something from your mother, have you ever clung onto her skirt or the hem and, and just beg her for something and you cling until she gives it to you? Has that ever happened? Oh, mom, you've got to do it, please. I beg you, let me get the new doll. Let me get whatever. Mom, please, please let me, whatever it is. And you cling and beg. So this is what you can do with the kiswa. You can go, cling onto the kiswa and beg a lot. Beg, beg a lot to help you. <clears throat> All right. Now the black stone. Mm -hmm. um, the prophet said, the black stone is the right hand of God on earth. With it, he shakes hands with his creatures, just as a man shakes hands with his brother. Now, you start moving. You started at the black stone. You're moving along, and you're just passing the first corner. It's called the uh, Iraqi corner, right? As Bilal looked up, the Kaaba seemed immense. It was amazing walking with people whose faces showed they came from all over the world. He couldn't believe he was finally taking part in what he had only seen in picture books. Right now, children, if you haven't been, you've just seen pictures like this. But guess what? Before you know it, you're going to be here too, walking around, and you're going to be know exactly what to do. And are there all kinds of prayers you say? when you're walking around the Kaaba. And then you come around the Shami corner and you reach this corner, it's called the Yemeni corner, right? And it's hard to get near the corners because there's so many people, but at least their father was able to bring them close enough to the Kaaba itself so they could touch the Yemeni corner. The prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, not only touched it as he made to waft, but he placed his cheek on it. So if you can, everybody, place your cheek. Yes, you have a question there. What is your question? When you touch the black stone, do you touch it once you like walk around the cab at once or like seven times? Well, you know, I'll just be quite honest. There's so many people there that you can't get close enough. You know, maybe sometime if you went at Fajr or at dawn or some middle of the night, uh, the ideal would be to touch it. But since you can't do the ideal, that's why we just put our hands out like this and say, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar. It's the same thing. And you go like this, you see? So you, do, you can touch it. That's a very good question. Thank you for asking it. All right. And then as, as you see you're at this corner, children. All right. Now you're going to move to the right. Okay, we're moving to the right, to the black stone again. And you're going to hear a prayer all these pilgrims are saying. They're saying, oh God, our Lord, give us goodness in this world and goodness in the next and save us by your mercy from punishments, right? So you're gonna learn that prayer. People are saying it in Arabic. 
But after you've gone around a few times, you always hear people. And finally, you get to feel comfortable. You always know you're going to be hearing it, right? So then this is, okay, you pass the black stone again. And right there next to the door, it's called the Babel Multazim. This special door, if you can reach up and touch it, they pretend you all are doing it, children. You're reaching up. And anything you ask Allah, he will answer your prayers. And when you get up close, you're touching it. And you can hear all these people from different countries. They're all trying to touch it too. And you can hear people crying and sobbing. What do you think people are asking for? What kinds of things? They've come from Timbuktu and from Japan and Afghanistan. They finally made it. And they're touching the door and they're asking for from the bottom when of their he was heart. Small, he always so, said Timbuktu. What? Timbuktu? Anyway, it doesn't matter. But you see, here is Bilal. He's, he's reaching up and he's asking. What kind of thing would any of you ask for? If you finally were there and you could have anything you wanted, what would you ask for, everybody? Jenna. What? Jenna. Jenna. You're the smart one. You're the that's exactly what you should ask for. <laughs> you're, Coronavirus you're really, going away. Yeah, you're really good, by the way. You're really smart. <laughs> okay. So then, you, then when you finish the seven tawafs, this is called the Makam Ibrahim. Under it is a footprint of our prophet, Sayyidina Ibrahim. When he was lifting some of the um, stones onto the Kaaba, he made a footprint and they have it covered very beautifully. You go over to that place, to the Makam Ibrahim, and you do you do two rakahs and you do two surahs that you all know. You all know Kulhu Allahu Ahad, don't you? Right. And you all know um, Kulya Ayuhul Kafirun. Do you know that one? You say those two, those are the two uh, surahs that you say. Yeah. Right. yeah, you, yeah that's you know right. those. You already that's, know those. That's half of um, Surah Kafirun. That's it. Yeah, well, you, those are the two you say when you're standing where Abraham was. See all the pilgrims standing here? You'll be standing with them. Imagine you're standing there right now. You're doing two rakahs of prayer and you're, say, you're saying those two, you're saying those two uh, surahs, all right? And then, you know what? You can go have a drink of Zemzem water, right? You're going to Zemzem water. It used to be when I made my first Hajj, the fountain was right near the Kaaba. But because there's so many people going around, they could have fallen and gotten hurt. So now they have pipes and they bring it outside and they have wonderful barrels of water here and they supply pepper cups. So you can go and get a drink of water at this point. All right. Now you see the mother and the two little boys here. Pretend you're with them. All right. Now we are going to do the sigh. Now this is the special running between the two hillocks like little mountains of Safa and Marwa. And do you know why we do this, everybody? Well, you need to know the full story. Before, okay. I remember the green light was there and my dad told me to run. Yes, you can get to do that. That's up ahead here. You can't quite see it in the picture, right? But um, anyway, you, you now uh, should know the story of why you do this. Okay, remember when Sayyidina Ibrahim, alayhi salam, brought his wife, beautiful Hajar, and they came, they came to this area, which became Mecca. They left Palestine, right? And they came here. And he told her, you know, uh, I have to be going and I'll come back. And she said, you do uh, everything that you are asked to do. I trust in Allah, whatever he asks us to do. But then her little baby Ishmael was thirsty. So she ran from one hillock to the other looking to see if there were any people coming that could help her find water. And at the seventh time, she didn't find anything. And she was really worried about the baby, but she trusted Allah. And you know what happened when she trusted Allah? Suddenly, a beautiful spring of water, Zemzem, came out of the ground. And it's still, yeah. bubble, it's still bubbling there. This is 4,000 years. You can still taste the same water. And the well keeps giving and giving and giving, right? And so um, you see, it's very important to always trust Allah, right? Not doubt or not be afraid. So now is the family. Now the family are leaving the Sai. And as they're leaving, 
they're very careful to give charity to everyone who reaches out. Remember in the book of Zakat last week, how if someone reaches out, you don't disappoint. It's very important because we have so many blessings. So we have to share them. What we have is on loan to us and it's a trust. So remember, so as the family was leaving and they're now leaving, they're going to go out. They're going out to, um, to the tent city of, of, of Minna. Look at the tents out there. Do you see it? Pretend you're arriving. You're going in the afternoon or evening. Look at all the tent city. And this is where you're going to sleep. You're going to sleep here because next day, tomorrow, is the day of Arafat. And that day is what Hajj really is. So you see, do you see how beautiful it is out there, everyone? And by the way, by the way, you see the people walking? Everybody's walking all the way there. It's not far from Mecca all the way out to Minna. It's about five miles. It's an easy walk. I've done it myself. It's nothing, okay? Now, some people may take cars or fancy cars. But the problem is maybe they're, they're doing it to show off or feel better than other people. So even if you're a rich person and you might feel a bit of pride because you have a fancy car, would it be better for you to walk and get rid of your pride? What would it be, children? Much better to walk. because we're, You're trying to polish your heart with the Hajj. Remember, the whole idea is you're polishing off everything so you can come back new like the day you were born. Right. So anyway, um, let's see what's the next. So anyway, here it says here, it says the walk from Mecca to Minna was a challenge, but a wonderful experience. The family enjoyed being in the company of pilgrims from the world over. Of course, all men were dressed alike, but their faces were from everywhere. Africa, China, Indonesia, all sorts of other places. Now, when they got to their tents, okay, the family got to their tents. Let's see what happened. When, okay, they decided to go out for a walk. And guess what, children? Rem imagine this. You're in your tent, and you're going to go out with your family, and you're walking, and you come to a bunch of tents where the people from Mauritania are there. And you can smell the cooking of Mauritania. You, you pass through the, 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 the Muslims who come from, from Canada. And we don't know what they're cooking, right? But suddenly, Layla here, Layla noticed an older lady, maybe from the Far East, who seemed all alone and in need. Immediately, she offered her some of the sandwiches they had with them. Layla whispered to her mother, Haj Abdullah told us that pilgrims should carry enough extra long so they can be generous. Imagine being stingy here. He explained giving charity from one's provisions on the road to pilgrimage is spending for the sake of Allah. So here is Layla, and she's giving some of the sandwiches. She's sharing them, right? Now, by the way, the, 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 uh, this day before Arafat, this nice, the day before day of Arafat, it's called uh, the Yom Tarawiyah. And this was the night, everybody, that Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam had a vision. Now, you all probably have heard this story, but if not, you need to know it. Abraham had this vision where uh, Allah, a vision said you should, you should sacrifice your beloved son. You should take his life. And Ibrahim thought, this must be from the devil. What a horrible thought. But the same dream came the next night. And then he knew Arafah. Just say he knew in Arabic as Arafah. And that's the day of Arafat. He knew that this was from Allah and he trusted God and he was willing to do anything that God asked. So he said to his son Ishmael, you know what he said? Oh my goodness, what do you think about this? I'm being commanded to take a knife and sacrifice you, right? Sacrum faceri, sacrifice to make sacred. And, and his son said, do as you were commanded, my father, right? Inshallah, you will find that I am patient right? And since both Ishmael and his father both surrendered, they had a command from Allah and they did and they said, we are ready to do it. You know what? Since they both surrendered, they submitted their wills to Allah. Then Allah said, oh, Ibrahim, right? You have already fulfilled the mission, the vision. 
So now they didn't, he didn't have to do that. That's why we sacrifice a lamb, because at that moment, a lamb was put in place of Ishmael. All right. So, um, by the way, so that the, the, the they, they, they start the, they start walking home here to back to their tents and they pass people, look at people from many different countries. The man on the left is from America. Mm -hmm. And his name is Waratha Dean. And this next man is from Venezuela. And then the little girl is from Germany. You see all the different countries that come, all the different families. So the next day, right, is the day of Arafat. The day, you know, you know what people do on this day? They, they spent the whole day asking God's forgiveness, right? And so, um, uh, Ibn Abbas said, I saw, the, I saw the prophet making supplications, right? Standing on Arafat with his hand on his heart, like a poor man asking for food. Imagine if our prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. We're, we're begging a lot. Shouldn't you be doing that too? So Bilal was a bit worried, you know, he was worried that maybe his Hajj wouldn't be acceptable to God. But it's said, if when you're at Arafat, when you're president at Arafat, you shouldn't think, it, it would be terrible to think that your Hajj wouldn't be, that your Hajj wouldn't be accepted and that God wouldn't forgive you. So don't ever think that. So then the next, that evening, people spend everybody the whole day, children, thousands of pilgrims, as far as your eye can see, you're, pretend you're there right now. You're all there, okay, you're standing there, you're in your beautiful clothing, you're standing with pilgrims as far, and everyone is asking Allah's forgiveness. And it's utterly beautiful. And then the sun starts to set, and you know what you're gonna do next? You're gonna start walking up this little hill to Muzdalifa to collect pebbles. So, you're gonna be walking up the hill, right? If you look back over the whole valley, you know what it's going to look like seeing people as far as your eye can see? It's going to look like a preview of the Yom al the last judgment, when we're all brought back to stand together before Allah. It'll look just this, it'll look like this. So you know what? You are actually in your religion, doing this Hajj, going to Mount, uh, going to the plain of Arafat. You are actually getting a preview of what it's going to look like at the end of time. Can you imagine getting a preview? getting an idea of what's ahead at the end of end of everyone's lives. So anyway, um, you start up the hill and you hear thousands of voices saying the Talbiya, right? And, oh, you know, even I was walking up the hill and a little woman went by and on top of her head, she had a box with a chicken in it and pots and pans hanging. She had some tattoos, she was African. And she looked at me and she said, Come on, come on, sister. And I got to the top of the hill and there were some Nigerians and they opened their umbrella and you know what was inside? Cookies and tea. And they said, please have some. And so after half the night has passed, you stay awake or you can sleep a little bit. Then you collect pebbles. Do you see these people collecting the pebbles? You collect 70 little tiny pebbles. But you only need seven on the first time, right? you'll be using them over the next few days, right? So then, you know, at dawn, you're going to walk back toward Mina, right? You're going to say the Talbiya that you know, and Allah, yes, question? Um, how long are we using pebbles for? How many, how many days? No, no, why do you need them? The pebbles? Yes. Ah, you're going to find out right now. Excellent question, my dear. Yeah, okay. So now you got the pebbles, the sun has come up and you go to, it's called the Jamarat. There are three columns and these represent like shaitan and, and you are going to throw your stones against them. And you're gonna, when you throw a stone, you're gonna be saying no to every doubt you ever had. It's, you're like thinking about Abraham. He said no to his temptations, didn't he? He must have had the temptation. I don't want to kill my son, but he overcame his doubt. So you're, if you have any doubts, you're saying no to your doubts, no to wrongdoings. So you throw these 
and and you do you you'll go several times to do it and so then uh, after you've thrown the stones you don't say the talbia anymore a lamb is sacrificed in because a lamb was substituted for ishmael and don't you all on at the eid don't you all have lamb to eat right yes so that's what you're celebrating this moment that's going on here in the out in the desert of saudi arabia right and of course you buy an animal of good quality and the meat is given to the poor because remember that your your generosity purifies you and then look what look what goes on with boys the next thing the boys do is they get their head shaved how would you like that boys yep you get your head shaved with women they just cut a little piece of hair back here right and after you've done this right it says the time had arrived to leave the state of ihram father and son easily found a barber who was shaving the heads of men and boys who were reciting oh god for every hair shaved off affirm for me a good deed and remove from me a bad one and raise my standing with you a degree okay now they head back they head back into Me into mecca they go walk back into mecca to do what's called the tawaf al ifada yes question yes uh, how many days are you supposed to uh, like camp or stay there in the tents um you see you've spent the night uh before the day of arafat and then you will you will spend three more nights there you know and you'll throw the rest of your pebbles yes um is the i thought you were not so supposed to cut your hair you're supposed to cut your hair and immediately throw it put it somewhere like in a bin because i thought jins could uh could uh could uh blow bad deeds on it and so maybe i don't i don't know about this i'm what i'm teaching you all here is just what it is from imam al ghazali but it could be these uh, we'll have to ask someone about that all right that's a good question we should ask it right so now the family goes back to the kaaba see the little boy his head is shaved there's his mom right they go back and they do the tawaf al ifada and this is completes the hajj right and the mother says we are lucky to be worn and dusty as we return to visit his house it's a brilliant reminder of who we really are Oh look everyone I can see the Kaaba through the columns. Now, the prophet peace and blessings be upon him. He loved people to be humble and barefoot and all disheveled like this, the hair all messed up because it showed that they were trying to be empty of everything. They weren't thinking, "Oh, I have to look good. I have to be dressed up. I have to be perfect clothing." It showed, right, that we are trying to empty everything from ourselves except our golden hearts are innate good huh? you told me not to do that okay you told me not to do that so then after doing a uh, doing tawaf we go back to the place of ibrahim and do two more of those rakahs with those verses that you know with those surahs you know and then again you can drink some zamzam here's the little german girl just think of how ancient the source of this water is i can almost taste these centuries going all the way back in time so when you all go and taste the zamzam pretend you're tasting it right now imagine tasting water it started from a well 4000 or more years ago all right so then at this point you go to the babul multazam and you make your final duas and then you go back out to the camp and you speak spend three more days in your tents and you throw the rest of the pebbles everybody yes and then you go back again to the kaaba i'll ask you answer your question right now and then you do the tawaf of farewell and then you go to medina yes what is your question yes is that a question that i have to leave oh you have to leave we only have 2 minutes more during medina can you just stay for medina for 2 minutes Just, we'll go really quick. Okay, we finished the Hajj, everybody. You've all been on the Hajj today. Mabruk, you've experienced the Hajj. You've imagined it. And now the next thing is, we go to Medina. Oh, you can see people from all over the world carrying their children. And if you get tired, your dad will carry you. All right. Now they have arrived in Medina. Um, 
Father Hamsa reminded the family, imagine that we are standing on the very ground on which the prophet and his companions walked. Imagine the humble reverence that he carried in his heart and the immense knowledge of God and that they are remembered together. We are nearing the house where he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, lived. See the green dome? That's over where his house was. And now he is buried there. Take each step with dignity and awe. Bilal was filled with, with joy. And by the way, you know, I'm going to tell you all something. The, the, there's a hadith by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, to visit me after my death is like visiting me in my life. So when you go to visit him here, it's as though he, Allah, he was Allah, alive. If you all were going to stand, be standing before him and he could hear you, what would you say to him? Somebody say what they would say to the Prophet. Yes, go ahead. If you were standing in front of him right now and you could speak to him, what would you say? Yes, I see your hand up. Go ahead. Um, uh, I wish we could uh, take, take off the dome and just and and just see him. <laughs> oh, that's so lovely. That's so lovely. Because guess what, kids? Let's yeah. pretend you're in Medina right now, and you're gonna say something to him. Whatever you say, he can hear. Can you imagine that? And more than that, do you know how when we say, um give our salams to the prophet all the time, right? Guess what? Allah is saying his salams continuously to the prophet. So when we say ours, we're joining Allah. Can you imagine joining Allah's salams, being part of that? What an honor, right? So, and remember, you're standing on the ground uh, where our religion and all of its laws were established. This is exactly where you'll be standing. And then the Next thing you do, all right? You go, go, visiting the tomb is the same of visiting him. So you be quiet and you have dignity and your manners and you're full of respect, all right? So here is, here is Bilal, he's standing in front of the tomb, all right? Father and son entered the mosque, which in, today encloses the garden, the prophet's garden, al Rauda, next to the prophet's house, peace and blessings be upon him. On entering, they first made two rakahs of bowing next to the pulpit, to the mimbar, and then they went to the nearby enclosure. You're, are you all with me right now? You're standing right here with me, right? And this is where the prophet's body is buried. His noble being is in the ground right in front of you, right? And then the father said to Bilal, he said, know that the prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, is aware of your presence. Okay, children. Pretend you're all here. We're all here right now. Know that he is aware of your presence and your greetings are conveyed to him by angels. Imagine he's lying before you. Even if you're in faraway lands, he's aware of the salams you're sending him. Even if you're in California or Indonesia, there's a hadith that says, he who blesses me once, God blesses 10 times. Also, by the way, you see where what you're looking at, this grill work, do you know there are two other people buried here? The companions Abu Bakr and the companion Omar. They are who helped establish the deen. They're buried here too. So you would be greeting them as well. And then you go back to the Rauda, to the inner garden, right? And you do can do some more uh, prayers and more supplications. Isn't Medina beautiful? Look at how beautiful it is. Now, this is what we're finishing up right now. So our little friend here can leave. Um, there are other things that are good to do while you're there, important visits. Here is al -Bakia. This is the graveyard and uh, the graves of the companion Osman, radiallahu anhu, is here. As well as, did you know the prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, had a little baby son named Ibrahim who died? He's buried here too, right? And also, uh, you would visit the Kuba Mosque, which is very, very beautiful. And some of the wells, they're wells that you could, that, that the prophet drank out of and washed in, you would visit the wells. And then uh, you've finished Medina and you're headed home. So you're headed back. Bilal said, a sign our great journey has been accepted is if we pull back from so many worldly concerns and renew our efforts to be ready for the next world. Father Hamza completed Bilal's words with Al-Ghazali's. 
after having met the house, this is the house of God right here in front of you. After having met the house of Allah, now you return and you make ready to meet the Lord of the house. So when you die, that is your great hope that you will meet the Lord of your house, right? And look, look what, look about Medina. We will come to, the grandmother said, we will come to know this dear granddaughter from our hearts and deeds. If we find on our return, our hearts turning away from this world of delusions, inclining toward closeness to Allah, ex the exalted, and find our conduct, how we act, more complying with the sacred law, then we can have confidence that Allah has accepted our Hajj. And now, children, Layla, the little girl who made the Hajj, she wrote in her diary, and this is the end of our presentation, she wrote in her diary, why was it so overwhelming for me? Be imagine you, all of you, imagine standing right here. And so Layla is saying, why is this so overwhelming? When in our normal daily life, in your homes right now, can you get a glimpse of the underlying awesome story of humankind? Because you know what happened at the Black Stone, you were at the beginning where Adam is asked by Allah, am I not your Lord? And so you have the contract with Adam, the big first man right there in that Black Stone. And then when you go to the plain of Arafat, you're you're having a preview of the very end of time when time is all over and everybody is gathered together when the trumpet blasts. So she said, imagine that I have been standing with every race on earth and, and I've had seen the black stones. And then we end by saying, Layla said, even though, now kids, this is, this is the end, pretend you're there. Even though you're, full of crowds, see how many people are there? Imagine you're there right now. Even though you've got a huge crowd, Layla said, you know, I found the experience very natural. She said, very natural. And I experienced my golden heart. I wasn't separated from other people. I was with the whole. Do you see here? If you were there with everybody, wouldn't you, would you feel separated or would you feel that you were, you were whole, right? So, what you have done here is Ghazali has introduced you to the mysteries of the pilgrimage, right? And it will change the way you look at your life. And then this, the book also has a manual. And then there's a, a children's book here, a children's book with lots of activities where the grandfather tells, talks to the little children. This is included in the bigger book. And then a bird comes and shows them his big chest because he's no longer alive. And they read his letters to them, and they do artworks. They make mosaics from pieces of colored paper. They make lists of the bad heart and the good heart. The bad heart says being lazy, being rude, being grumpy, right? Um, and then they, they also learn about the three keys that open the doors that bring them closer to meeting the king. They remember the story about their boat turning over with all their stuff and their golden heart going on and on. They remember that you have to dress well, that your clothing makes you play the part. If you're dressed slobbily, you feel slobby. And they learn again, they practice weighing their good deeds and their bad deeds. And they, they love the thought of, of going on the Hajj with their grandfather and being carried by their father on the Sai. And look at the tents they got to stay in with thousands of pilgrims, the simple tent they spent the day before Arafat. And this little girl, We'll end with her. She said, look into your heart luggage and pull out your third golden key. If you remember, this key is called trusting God, which means everybody, kids, pay attention, to happily say yes to everything that the king, meaning Allah, everything he asks you to be, ask of you because of your love for him, right? And then the, the children, this is on the day of the Eid, the children are having fun. And look at all the activities. They, you can paint pebbles, you can imagine gazing, you can make kabas out of paper. The prophet said to visit me after my death is like visiting me during my life. So yes, we really went to visit the prophet himself. So children, oh yes, okay, I'll ask, it's over, I finished. Yes, you wanted to leave, didn't you? Yes, uh, can I tell you two things? Yes. You certainly are, yes. The first thing is I know something about that 
of the black stone yes. um, on Judgment Day. Yes. A lot uh, makes it alive, like it's then yes. other than they are enough, it, it have a tongue and then it talks. <laughs> Sarah, thank you so much, Sarah. You, you're, you're so bright and so wonderful to contribute. You know, bless your heart. I mean, I, I know that this was hard for all of you, but children, today you got to go on the Hodge. Did you imagine yourself in all of those places? Did you imagine it? Good, good. Well, I hope you had a blessed Hodge a preview of Hodge. Yes, Sarah, another question? Yes. I also started doing voodoo. What did you say? I also started doing, I also started doing voodoo. Oh, you're doing the voodoo right now? I just did it today. I'm mm -hmm. so proud of you. I'm so proud of you, Sarah. That's just so wonderful. And you did it you, when you were washing your hands, you thought, when you rinsed your mouth, you were also asking a lot to help you say the right things, weren't you? You'll never, you. never do your voodoo differently. It'll feel thin and not happening. I'm so, I'm so grateful, Sarah, for that. I'm so pleased. I'll Anybody else doing their voodoo, voodoo better? Anybody praying better, doing their voodoo uh, better? I have a question. Yes. So, it, so if your good teeth are made. Okay. Higher, if, if you do the money in Mokka, does, does that mean, does that mean your bad deeds are, are lower than they, than they, when you do them in Mokka or higher? Well, it, it's, it, what Jibril, what Ghazali is reminding us of is that when you're in Mecca and Medina, one of the important reasons for going there is your prayers and your good deeds are just multiplied you get more of them if you fast one day it's worth ten thousand days or something like that so i mean it's the these ideas are to show you how important our blessed cities of mecca and medina are thank you jabril for that any other questions or comments i have a comment all right mm -hmm. <laughs> I learned to echo myself. Who is speaking? Raise your hand so I can see you. Who is speaking? Is it Jabril or who is talking right now? Abdul Basit. Abdul Basit, yes, Abdul Basit. Say it. Now, what did you like to say, my dear? I learned to echo myself. You did? Yep. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Mashallah, you're so beautiful. Thank you for, for making that comment. That's wonderful. Thank you, Abba Basit. Yes, Sarah, you want to say something more? I also started the real Quran. Oh, that's wonderful. Oh, that's wonderful. Yes. And what's, I see my other hands raised. Yes. So I think by now, you all are very tired. Oh my goodness, we went an hour and a half. I feel so sad. You know, it was supposed to be an hour and now it, you must be very tired. Well, guess what children, I love you so much. And next week we're going to do the book of belief. And then you're gonna find out who and what and where is Allah, right? And the things we believe. Yes, one more question here, go ahead. No. Good night. Um, I'm sorry I kept you so late, but it's so lovely being with you and you all are such good children. Can I tell you something? Yes, 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 Nazim. Wait, can I tell you something here? Yes, go ahead and say. Uh, so, uh, I, Naz, Nazanin, yes, yes. It was really nice uh, having you read the book to us about the well and Ismail. Oh, I'm so glad. Thank you. Uh, um. I, what I'm hoping is that, you know, this was a big and wonderful book with hundreds of wonderful, fun stories. I've only given you a few highlights, everybody. I really would love it if you'll now get to read the real book and do the activities and make and play the games that go with it and do the workbooks because you'll have fun doing all the activities, really fun things. All right, children. 
Uh, can I tell you something? Yes. Uh, so uh, this is the wild cracks book. So. Oh, that Zahra. That's is that your Yusuf, right? Or is, is that Zahra? Wow. Oh, this looks lovely. What a lovely book. So You're it's in... like about animals. Oh, I love that book. We love animals. Thank you so much. Well, I'm tired now and I'm going to go to bed. You all are three hours earlier than me. I'm 1030 at night. So I'm going to give you say assalamu alaikum and sleep well. And you know from the wudu story, if you do wudu before you go to sleep, you have a golden heart when you're sleeping at night. It's really special. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Bye. Bye bye, dear. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Bye.